Mutation. It is the key to our evolution. It is how we have evolved from a single-celled organism into the dominant species on the planet. Some people have evolved less than others, <coughs> but that's beside the point. This process is slow, normally taking thousands and thousands of years. But every few hundred millennia, evolution <laughs> takes a flying leap backward. Greetings, bubs and bubettes, and welcome to Cinematic Excrements. As many of you are likely aware, we've got another chance to see Hugh Jackman play everyone's favorite mutant, Wolverine. Probably for the last time. And if the early reviews are to be believed, Logan is shaping up to be pretty awesome. So I figured it was about time we took a look back at the character's not-so-awesome origins. It all started back in the year 2000 with X-Men, directed by Bryan Singer. The first time Stan Lee and Jack Kirby's mutant superhero group graced the big screen. The movie begins with a girl named Marie, aka Rogue, played by Anna Paquin, whose mutation causes her to absorb part of someone's life force whenever she touches them. And in the case of mutants, she briefly inherits their superpowers. After inadvertently putting her boyfriend in a coma, not the best way to start a relationship. I mean, unless you're into that sort of thing, I'm not here to judge. She runs away and ultimately meets a man named Logan, aka Wolverine, played by Hugh Jackman, who has super healing powers, retractable metal claws, amazing hair, and a charming personality. Cyclops, right? You wanna get out of my way? He's just so lovable. After getting his ass handed to him by this huge fucker called Sabretooth, Wolverine and Rogue are rescued by the X-Men, led by Charles Xavier, aka Professor X, played by Patrick Stewart who runs a school for gifted youngsters in New York. He, along with Cyclops, Storm, and Jean Grey, have been at odds with another group calling themselves the Brotherhood of Mutants, consisting of Sabretooth, Toad, Mystique, and their leader, Eric Lencher, aka Magneto, played by Ian McKellen. The X-Men would like very much for mutants and regular humans to live together in harmony and peace. Magneto, on the other hand, as a Holocaust survivor, has seen firsthand how humanity sometimes treats those who are different and considers normal humans a threat to him and his kind. And he will stop at nothing to ensure mutant prosperity, even if it means the deaths of innocents. Like many people, I was a huge fan of this movie when it first hit theaters. I loved the characters and their unique superpowers. McKellen, Stewart, and Jackman were awesome. The action sequences were a ton of fun. The comedic bits worked pretty well. Physics. And I really liked the fact that the villains had understandable motivations and weren't just evil for the sake of it. Also, point of interest, the movie takes place in the not-too-distant future, next Sunday AD, and everyone appears to have widescreen TVs, a prediction that turned out to be fairly accurate. Looking back on the movie today, I still enjoy it quite a bit, though it does have a few flaws. For one thing, they decided to have Halle Berry attempt a Kenyan accent for Storm to match the character's comic book origins, and good lord, it did not work. Apparently, they didn't bother to hire a dialect coach for her, and when it came time to film the sequel, they dropped the accent entirely and just had her use her normal voice with no explanation for the change. Also, I still don't understand why Cyclops is the leader of the X-Men when he really doesn't show any leadership qualities in the film. I would assume Professor X chose him to lead the team for a reason, but I'll be damned if I know what that reason is. As far as I can tell, the character's only real trait is... well... You're a dick. Exactly. And another thing. Do you remember that scene where Magneto kidnaps Rogue? And the police try to stop him, but since Magneto can control metal, he can easily turn their cars and guns against them. And Professor X tries to stop Magneto by mind-controlling Sabretooth and Toad, but he can't control Magneto's mind because his helmet blocks Xavier's telepathy. So Magneto just threatens to blow all the cops' brains out, and Xavier gives up and lets them go. So... Why didn't he just have Sabretooth or Toad remove Magneto's helmet? what makes you weak. But in spite of its flaws, it's still a fun superhero movie. And it was a huge hit, which naturally led to a sequel. X2, X-Men United. After Magneto was captured at the end of the last film and thrown in his plastic prison, the X-Men have a new threat to deal with in the form of Colonel William Stryker, played by Brian Cox. After Stryker convinces the President of the United States to allow him to investigate Xavier's school, he leads a strike force into the mansion and kidnaps several students, along with Professor X and Cyclops. 
Having learned how to build his own version of Cerebro, his plan is to brainwash Professor X into using his bootleg Cerebro to find every mutant on Earth and kill them with his psychic powers. Because he can apparently do that now. This leads to Magneto and Mystique transitioning from villains to anti-heroes of sorts as they forge an unlikely alliance with the X-Men to stop Stryker from committing genocide. Iceman and Pyro, who had brief appearances in the first movie, are brought into the foreground in the sequel, and the movie introduces some new characters like Stryker, Lady Deathstrike, and my personal favorite character in the franchise, Nightcrawler, played by Alan Cumming. His mutation gives him the power of teleportation, which he shows off in the awesome opening sequence where he attacks the White House after having been brainwashed by Stryker. But when he's not being brainwashed by genocidal maniacs, he's a very gentle soul and strong in his faith. Ironic given his demonic appearance. There's still a lot of focus on Wolverine's character, and we get some hints at his mysterious past and his former relationship to Colonel Stryker. Storm gets more screen time thanks to Halle Berry's increased popularity, and we get glimpses here and there of a great power awakening within Jean Grey, which will come into play in the third movie. I keep feeling something terrible is about to happen. Well, you're not wrong, but we'll get to that. And there's more of the same stuff you loved in the first movie. Fun action sequences, a variety of mutant superpowers, and the parallels between mutants and real-world minorities. Have you tried... not being a mutant? But like the first movie, it's also got a few flaws. For one thing, this line of dialogue. I was piloting Black Ops missions in the jungles of North Vietnam where you were sucking on your mama's tit at Woodstock, Kelly. Brian Cox and Bruce Davison are the same age. And it's not like they don't look it! There's also a love triangle going on with Wolverine, Cyclops, and Jean that I never thought was handled very well. Much like Cyclops' supposed leadership qualities, his relationship with Jean was always horribly underdeveloped, and throwing Logan into the mix just made things even more confusing. And, of course, the ending. So, the captured X-Men have been rescued from Stryker's base and have to get the hell out of Dodge before the dam ruptures and they're swept away by the river. But they can't get the jet started for some reason. So Jean exits the jet, somehow without any of the dozen people on board noticing, and she somehow manages to start the jet's engines using her telekinetic powers. Why did she have to go outside to do that? And she holds off the river with one hand while lifting the jet out of harm's way with the other. Okay, now that everyone's safe, Nightcrawler can teleport out there and grab her, right? You get up now! She's not letting me. I'm sorry, what? I know what I'm doing. This is the only way. Is it? Because it seems to me this could have easily been avoided. Hell, you don't even need Nightcrawler. You're a telekinetic. Just use your power on yourself and fly. Duh. And she dies for no good goddamn reason at all. This ending is stupid. So it's not perfect, but it still has a lot of good stuff going for it. And like the first movie, it was a huge hit, which led to movie number three, X-Men The Last Stand. With Singer busy working on Superman Returns, Brett Ratner found himself in the director's chair for the first and only time in the franchise. This time around, the story focused on humans discovering a cure for mutation, suppressing the mutant gene and offering a normal life for any mutant that wants it. This leaves mutant kind heavily divided. Some are jumping at the chance to finally fit in with society, while others see it as an insult that their mutation is treated as a disease. Magneto in particular sees the cure as humans attempting to exterminate mutants and raises an army to destroy the source of the cure, which ironically happens to be a mutant boy, and anyone who stands in his way. And it's up to the X-Men to stop him. This movie is a right mess. Although it has a few bright spots. One of those bright spots is Kelsey Grammer as Dr. Hank McCoy, a.k.a. Beast. He's charming, highly intelligent, and well-spoken, but also a total badass when the situation calls for it. And he's not afraid to put Wolverine in his place. My boy, I have been fighting for mutant rights since before you had claws. Did he just call me boy? Yes, sir, he did. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense since you're supposed to be way older than him, but Beast is awesome, so we're gonna give him a pass. And I do like the concept of introducing a cure for mutation and seeing how various mutants react to such a thing. Plus, the huge fucking action sequence at the end is a lot of fun to watch. But this movie did far more things wrong than right. For one thing, we have another love triangle, this time with Rogue, Iceman, and Kitty Pride. And every time these three show up on screen, the entire movie just grinds to a halt. Iceman's with Rogue, but he's getting friendly with Kitty. But they're just friends. 
Or are they? And Rogue's not too happy about it, and Iceman's like, come on, baby, don't be like that, it doesn't mean anything, and oh my god, I don't care! They also introduced a ton of new characters, and they really went overboard here. Most of them don't really have time to do anything. Hell, they gave Angel a very dramatic introduction as the son of the man who introduced the mutant cure, and then he disappears from the movie until the very end. I know the X-Men have been around forever, and there are a lot of characters that the fans want to see on the big screen. But sometimes, less is more. That being said, what the hell happened to Nightcrawler? He's not in the movie, and there is no explanation for the character's absence. He couldn't have thrown one line of dialogue in that said he went back to Germany or something? And the parallels between mutants and minorities got a little too on the nose in this movie. Raven, I asked you a question. I don't answer to my slave name. Slave name? Slave name? Fuck yourself! And then there's Jean Grey. Remember how she died at the end of X2? Well, she got better and was reborn as Phoenix. And she killed Cyclops. Off screen. That's right. A major character from the previous two movies dies off screen. I didn't care much for Cyclops, but he still deserved better. She did kill Professor X on screen, however, by exploding him into a million pieces. But by the end of the movie, he also got better. And I'm not even gonna try to make sense of that. And then she joins Magneto and proceeds to do fuck all for the rest of the movie until the very end. And three minutes later, she gets killed by Wolverine. They spent so much of X2 hinting at and building up Phoenix and then completely wasted it. Weak. There are many more things this movie did wrong, but if I list them all, we'll be here all day. And we still have to get to the actual subject of today's review. So let's not waste any more time than we already have. It's time to talk about X-Men Origins Wolverine. The Wolverine character, and specifically Jackman's portrayal of the character, were easily the most popular part of the X-Men films, so it was only a matter of time before he was given his own movie. It's a shame that it ended up being the worst X-Men film to date. Our story begins in 1845, where we find Logan, or should I say, James, as a small child just as he becomes a mutant. So we finally have some idea of just how old Wolverine is. And he apparently was a childhood friend of Victor Creed, aka Sabretooth. You remember him. I assure you, this won't make much sense later. One night, Victor's father suddenly decides to murder James' father, who somehow doesn't bleed at all despite getting shot, because they really wanted that PG-13 rating. So Wolverine goes apeshit and whips out his brand new bone claws. <laughs> he does that. And he kills his father's murderer. But as he's dying, Victor's father drops a huge bombshell on young Wolverine. James, I am your father. All of this probably could have been its own movie, or at least an episode of a TV miniseries, but in X-Men Origins Wolverine, it happens in the span of four minutes. I'm not kidding. I have so many questions. First, why is Logan now called James? Second, why was he adopted? Third, why was his brother Sabretooth not adopted? Fourth, why are Sabretooth and Wolverine suddenly brothers in this universe? Fifth, why did his biological father kill his adopted father? Sixth, does this have anything to do with anything? Actually, I can answer that last question. No, it doesn't. None of this has anything to do with the rest of the movie and is never mentioned again. And before one of you says, well, you can get the answers to the other questions in the comics, I shouldn't have to. The movie should be able to stand on its own. We've been over this. And then we get a montage of Wolverine and Sabretooth, played by Liev Schreiber, fighting in various wars throughout American history. This would have made for an interesting movie, but all we get is a montage. Weak. Eventually, Wolverine and Sabretooth are recruited by Major Stryker, played this time by Danny Houston, to form a sort of mutant mercenary task force. And this is the moment where a million fanboys cry it out in terror. For this, ladies and gentlemen, is technically the first time Ryan Reynolds portrayed Wade Wilson, aka Deadpool, on the big screen. But I am not going to call him Deadpool. I'm going to call him Dino. Deadpool in name only. Because that's exactly what he is. Oh sure, there are hints of the real Deadpool in this character, and he does have a couple of funny lines, but he's mostly just a wise guy with a couple of swords. And if you're disappointed now, don't worry. It gets worse. You didn't have that mouth on you, Wade. You'd be the perfect soldier. 
Spoiler alert! <laughs> Son of a bitch. Anyway, after a rather silly action sequence where Fred Dukes bugs bunnies a tank... Yeah, that just happened. Wolverine decides to quit his job when he finds out mercenaries generally aren't good people. Who knew? I didn't sign up for this. What exactly did you sign up for? And he leaves the group despite Sabretooth's protestations. We can't just let you walk away. They then proceed to just let Jimmy walk away. We then fast forward six years and learn that Jimmy, who now goes by the name Logan, because reasons, is living a quiet life in the Canadian Rockies. He's a lumberjack and he's okay. He even got himself a girlfriend, Kayla Silverfox, played by Lynn Collins. He does have the occasional nightmare. <laughs> he still does that. Honey, when I said I wanted you to bone me, that's not what I meant. But otherwise, life is going pretty good for Mr. Logan and Miss Kayla. Gee, I sure hope nothing bad happens. Oh, what do you know? She dead. Who could have possibly seen that coming? <laughs> I'll knock it off. It turns out Sabretooth killed Kayla because... Uh... He was bored? I don't know. Fortunately, Stryker just happens to show up and offers Logan the chance at revenge by putting him through an experimental program that will make him an indestructible weapon. Well, isn't his timing just perfect? But I'm sure it's just a coincidence and he and Sabretooth aren't secretly working together. Spoiler alert, of course they are! We're gonna make you indestructible, but first, we're gonna have to destroy you. That doesn't make sense. And you know what happens next. Wolverine gets the adamantium treatment and becomes the superhero we all know and love. Unfortunately, this was all a plot by Stryker to test his new Weapon X program, and Logan overhears Stryker give the order to erase his memory. How he plans to do that, I don't know. And Wolvie don't play that. God, I swear, half his dialogue is just... They try to kill Logan even though they know full well they just made him indestructible. That was the entire point. You know, for an elite squad of mercenaries, they're kind of stupid. And cut an X into the wall for the trailer, yes, very good. So Logan escapes the facility and, hang on a second, wasn't the base at Alkali Lake supposed to be, you know, under a lake, not on top of a waterfall? Did director Gavin Hood even watch the other movies? And he runs into some old couple's barn. Naked. Calm down, ladies. It's PG-13. You're not going to get to see Hugh Jackman's, uh, Wolverine. The old couple take the naked man's sudden appearance surprisingly well. They even feed him and give him a fresh set of clothes, and my god, this CGI is terrible. This came out nine years after the original X-Men. How does it look worse? Anyway, these old folks really seem to have taken a shine to Logan. I sure hope nothing bad happens to them. Oh, how the hell did Logan make it out of that explosion? I know he's indestructible, but the bike isn't. And we get another very silly action sequence that ends with Wolverine leaping into the air and taking out a helicopter single-handedly. And if that wasn't silly enough for you, here's the obligatory, unflinching, slow-motion walk-away-from-explosion shot. That blast is only a few feet away. The shockwave should have knocked him into the next area code. Anyway, while Sabretooth hunts down and captures a young Scott Summers... Oh yeah, Cyclops is in this movie. No reason, he just is. Wolverine has learned Victor and Stryker have a hidden island base somewhere and is trying to find its location. He checks in with his old colleagues, Will I Am and Fred Dukes, the latter of which has put on a little weight. I ain't leaving here till you tell me where Victor is. Oh, come on, Bob, for old time's sake, huh? Did you just call me... Blob? Oh, fuck you! You really expect me to believe he misheard Bub as Blob? No, not buying it. Logan eventually calms Fred down, the hard way, but he has no idea where the base is. He does, however, know someone who once escaped from the island. Ladies and gentlemen, at long last, I give you the big screen debut of fan favorite Remy LeBeau, aka Gambit played by Taylor Kitsch. The fans had been waiting years for this moment, and for their patience, they were rewarded with what amounts to a glorified cameo. Hardly seems worth the wait. Gambit has only a few minutes of screen time and really doesn't do much with it. He gets in a fight with Wolverine, 
for reasons, and it's no better than the other action sequences in this movie. Physics. Then he flies Wolverine to Stryker's Island because they're suddenly friends now. Just go with it. And then he pisses off until the very end of the movie where he pops up one last time to say hello and then pisses off again. You could remove him from the movie entirely and you wouldn't have to change much. I like Gambit too, but if you don't have anything for him to do, don't put him in the fucking movie. Did you learn nothing from The Last Stand? So Wolverine finally has a chance to confront Stryker. But wait, there's a twist. Silver Fox is alive! How can this be? They gave me a shot of hydrochlorothiazide. It reduces the heart rate so low it appears you flatline. Yeah, I looked up hydrochlorothiazide, and no, I'm not gonna spell it, and that's not what it does. It's a diuretic. It might make you wet yourself, but that's about it. And does that mean Logan saw Kayla covered in blood and didn't even bother to check for any kind of wound? Logan, you deserve everything bad that has happened to you. After he's confronted with this information, Logan just... walks away. Yeah, just like that, he suddenly has no desire to kill Stryker. What manner of horseshit is this? But then Sabretooth shows up and starts choking Kayla for absolutely no reason at all, especially considering they're supposed to be on the same side, and her scream somehow snaps Logan out of it, and he races back for one last fight with Sabretooth. <laughs> He just stuck those claws into Victor's torso. No blood. If they were gonna be this violent, they really should have just gone for the R. Trying to make moments like that PG-13 just looks silly. Logan can't quite bring himself to kill Victor and simply knocks him unconscious. Then Kayla informs Wolverine that Stryker forced her to work for him by kidnapping her sister, and I don't know why she waited until now to mention this, but in any case, Logan agrees to help her free her sister and the rest of the captured mutants. And this is the moment where Stryker unleashes his ultimate weapon. He's been gathering DNA samples from various mutants in order to combine them into one super mutant, and this is the end result. Ladies and gentlemen, the final form of Dino. Sure, Stryker calls him Deadpool, but this is not fucking Deadpool. Deadpool certainly isn't a cyborg. He certainly didn't have retractable swords that are so long his arms wouldn't be able to bend when they're retracted. And for crying out loud, they sewed his mouth shut. Deadpool is supposed to be the merc with a mouth. And they made him a mute. Were they trying to piss off the fans? Anyway, while Wolverine fights Dino, the rest of the mutants run for the hills, but Kayla stays behind as it looks like she might actually die for real this time. And then... Left. Oh, I almost forgot about this. The mutants are rescued by Professor X. Yeah, they actually roped Patrick Stewart into a cameo, and they used CGI to make him look younger. Have I mentioned how much the CGI in this movie sucks? And it's not the first time they've done this. They did the same thing to Stuart and McKellen in The Last Stand, and it didn't look any better there. Again, did they learn nothing from The Last Stand's mistakes? And I thought this movie was supposed to be about Wolverine's origin. Did they really need to cram in Cyclops' origin as well? Meanwhile, Sabretooth joins the fight against Dino, because at this point, why not? They've clearly established by now that this character is crazy, so we really shouldn't expect any of his actions to make sense and they end up decapitating Dino, and Sabretooth pisses off so he can go dye his hair blonde and join Magneto and never acknowledge his connection to Wolverine again. And Kayla dies for real, thus fulfilling this character's purpose, or lack thereof. And if you will recall, in the original trilogy, Wolverine had no memory of his connection to Stryker. So how did he lose his memories? Stryker shoots him in the head with an adamantium bullet. Yeah, really. Magical mind-erasing bullet. But I guess that's not quite as silly as a magical mind-erasing kiss. They saved that for X-Men First Class. God, this franchise has issues. Oh, and there's one more thing. Dino apparently survived, despite getting his head chopped off. Bullshit. Don't you shush me, you know it's bullshit! Well, that's X-Men Origins Wolverine. 
Believe it or not, it's not entirely without merit, though not for lack of trying. I thought Liev Schreiber did a pretty good job as Sabretooth, all things considered, and Ryan Reynolds had his moments. Dino sucked, but it wasn't his fault. But that's about it, really. The action sequences were poorly done, the special effects were crap, the movie had more characters than it knew what to do with, and the story was a stupid, stupid mess. The movie received mixed reviews from critics and fans alike, and even Hugh Jackman himself was unhappy with the film. Despite the mixed reception, it did perform well at the box office, though not as well as Fox would have liked, and it made significantly less money than X2 and The Last Stand. Fox blamed this on piracy as a work print of the film leaked online a month before its theatrical release. That may have hurt the film to a certain extent, but I would like to think the movie would have performed better had it simply been, well, better. X-Men Origins Wolverine was supposed to have been the first of a series of prequel movies, with the second being X-Men Origins Magneto. However, the Magneto film ended up in development hell and was ultimately scrapped in favor of X-Men First Class. I am okay with this. If the film's quality would have been anything like Wolverine's, canceling the film was the best thing they could have done. Sometimes a character's origins are better left shrouded in mystery. Well, what should we do next time? What should we do? Oh, that's right! The Razzies were announced recently, weren't they? I almost forgot about that. Okay, let's just see who won Worst Picture. Could it possibly have been Batman vs- Oh. Oh. Shit. I'm way too cool to look at this explosion. Bub.